Hi. For those of you who, who recently joined us, my name's Tom Maloney. I'm director of the Centre of African Studies here at the University of Edinburgh and convener of the conference. Welcome to Edinburgh. I have one announcement. Um, at 1900 tonight, we've got a performance by the Ha Orchestra. They're getting rave reviews from those who have seen them so far. Escorts will be waiting in Bristow Square from 1830 uh, to take you to the oldest concert hall in Edinburgh, St. Cecilia's, uh, which was fully restored to its full glory a couple of years ago. It's a 10 minutes walk from here. Um, it's located in the maps at the front of your conference booklets. The, the Haar Orchestra is pretty unusual. It fuses traditional African and European instruments and brings together musicians from Burkina Faso, Ghana, Guinea, Gambia, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Morocco, Belgium, Denmark, France, and Scotland. These musicians have been working for the past year to compose a portfolio of brand new and really beautiful pieces of music as research, especially for ICAS. And these pieces are all on the conference theme of connections and disruptions. Most of the musicians are refugees or migrants from Africa, uh, forced to move to Europe under very difficult circumstances, and they've chosen to focus on the ideas of travel, identity, and memory. So please do attend Haar Orchestra at 1900 tonight. Without further ado, this is the last from me for today. I'll hand over to Victoria Uwanhunda from BBC Africa. Victoria, please. Thank you so much, Tom, and well done on the name. I know it's not an easy one to say. Um, as Tom said, my name is Victoria Wonghunda. I'll be chairing this uh, panel to this, this afternoon. I'm a journalist with BBC Africa, um, Focus on Africa Radio and TV. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Africa is close to my heart, um, born and raised. And it's, it's good to be here to be able to speak about topics that rarely do engage people, not just in the economical world, but also people who are doing things aside, which again, do affect uh, Africa and Africans, whether on the continent or in the diaspora. So without further ado, uh, we'd like to introduce our panel tonight for the discussion, which is, is, Africa, is Africa's future capitalist? So I would like to start off from my left, uh, Sangu Dele, who is an entrepreneur, and he's into startups, he's from Ghana. Um, next to me is lovely Atia Nondomo. She is an independent consultant and uh, social policy advocate. And I've got um, Raha Desai, who is a filmmaker, award-winning journalist. Um, and I've got Hazel Gray, who is from Cass here in Edinburgh. Um, so I'm just going to give them a chance and a moment to introduce themselves and tell us something about themselves before we start. Sangu. Sure. So as was mentioned, I, I'm, a t I'm an entrepreneur and a tech investor. But what's more interesting is I probably have the largest family here. My father was one of 86 children. And so I think I have maybe five or 600 cousins. And if you have a bigger family, beer tonight is on me. It's, it's hard to match that, so I won't go the direction of how many children we have. Um, Amatieno has, uh, has been introduced. I, hmm, who am I? I mean, I am passionate about social justice and trying to see a better world. Obviously, as you grow older, perhaps, and having tried to make your own contribution, uh, you are humbled by just how long it takes, but you have to keep persisting. So I still aim for social justice and do, in small ways, work to contribute to that, to a better world. Yeah, that's not too bad, not too much echo from up here. Yeah, competing with Sagu, uh, my mother had 10 sisters, four brothers, so I've got about two, three hundred cousins in, in Cape Town. I can't compete with that, but when I told my youngest son that I was going to be talking about the future today, he said, does that mean you're going to be talking about cosmic cookies? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm a senior lecturer here at CAS, and uh, my field of research is the political economy of industrialization. So that's the angle that I'll be thinking through this question today. <laughs> 
Thank you to all our, for our panels. My family is not that large and I thought we were, but here we are. Um, so I would like to kick this one off with basically what we are here to hear and to, to discuss. Is Africa's future capitalist? And I would just like to start with you, Rehad. Um, let's kick this one off. Is Africa's future capitalist? What are your thoughts? Well, I wanted to tell two uh, short stories. Uh, which relate to two films that I've uh, recently made um, and which were really two historical landmarks in terms of where I come from in South Africa. And that is the Marikana Massacre and the general strike, the great general strike which followed and the Fees Must Fall uh, movement. And some people were uh, in, in the audience last night when we, we screened the film. And I've got a couple of copies for those of you who want to get your hands on it. The, really, it's, it's impressions. Uh, what did, but I think that needs to be foregrounded by something which is quite universal, particularly in the global south. And that is, um, what is called the two-stage theory, which drove much of the nationalist movement, uh, their th theoretical underpinnings of how social change would unfold. Um, and this is particularly relevant for, for our continent. And what they said was essentially that you know, national democracy was the, the first stage which we all had to rally around. And that meant uh, radicals, socialists, uh, certainly communists with the big C, and this is the theory of the communists with the big C, um, that we needed to ally ourselves to the nationalist movement. And I think that that's been a major historical blunder for our development because nationalism um, is a very narrow focus and its, uh, its focus, it, it, its champions are the middle class, uh, it's, which has a very narrow social base in countries uh, like my own. Um, and it's really, its model is one of adopting the Western development paradigm where we need to industrialize very much like the process that occurred in, in the UK and Europe and, and uh, America and so on. And um, through that process, we will bring our economies uh, up to speed, out of their slumber, and meet the needs of our people. Well, if you didn't know, capitalism hasn't met the needs of certainly my people and the wider African continent. There are pockets of capitalism and that has generated uh, a tremendous amount of turmoil because that capitalism is based on cheap labor. It's based on a system which de demands a strict policing of labor in many ways, and it's, we know about the compound systems and so on. But coming to Marikana, um, the, you know, we, the, the unions which were led by our, the mine workers union, which was led by our current president, Cyril Ramaphosa, um, had for many years as part of the so social contract as, uh, and, and it, the big trade union federation policed uh, the militancy of the mine workers who were living on well, uh, whose wages have historically been very low and repressed through, through numerous mechanisms. Historically much of it legislated. Uh, the social contract was something that was not legislated. And the, what had happened in the years preceding the massacre of August 12, uh, 
2012 was the emergence of workers' committees. And these workers' committees were really taking, the union would never ask for anything more than inflation-based increases. When these platinum mines in particular, and a number of the coal mines and other minerals were making huge amounts of money in the commodity booms that began in the 90s and went through to 2008. And it was these workers' committees that began, um, that were all of a sudden in the post-2008 and here really 2010 and 11 period clamped down on. These were structures which were not official in, in, in any way, but they were elected by their workers. And they were demanding um, an increase of, uh, of $50 in today's terms for rock drillers. And all of a sudden the company said, after years of negotiating with these structures, we don't know who you are. Who are you? Challenging their very dignity as people who work 12 hours a day, six days a week for a pittance. And that led to um, the security guards being called in and the police being called in. And um, in South Africa, mine, working, mine worker strikes, you never call the police. You know what that's going to lead to. So what does, what does Marikana and the strike that followed represent historically? It represents uh, a group of workers who are now moving outside of the system against their own trade unions and formulating quite quickly. Uh, once they were ignored, their demands were ignored, the, the concept of a living wage. And their living wage was a whopping 50% more than what they were getting paid. And trade unionists, many of them radical and socialist inclined, said, what, these guys are on living a pipe dream. They're living in some utopia. How the hell do they think they're going to achieve such, such a demand? Uh, 34 people were killed in the space of 20 minutes on one day in an attempt to break that strike. The strike was not broken. It went on for a few more weeks and they achieved very substantial pay increases that got them closer to the living wage. But what did it do? It unleashed a wave of unofficial strikes, 45 in the mining sector alone, never mind what happened in, amongst the farm workers who were getting paid the equivalent of $7 a day for making the fine South African wine that I'm sure many of you have savoured. Now, it was, and, and it was that spirit, really, that impulse, which was going against the heart of the system, the heart of the political economy, which was based on a containment of, of, of militancy, an attempt to assimilate South Africa's milit militant traditions or traditions of militancy inside the, the, the working class into this capitalism that somehow now, post-1994, was supposed to become all-inclusive. And it was the shock waves of that massacre and that strike that went on in 2014 that lasted a full four, five months. Um, that, uh, and there was the longest strike in our labor history uh, and got us, again, um, closer to this notion of the living wage, but certainly not close enough. It's only uh, in 2020 will they be receiving what they demanded and fought for in 2012 and 2014. 
12,500 rand a month, just under $1,000. Now, this assimilation project uh, was at the heart of the South African university system. That really, what we're training you to do is to come into this rapacious system, uh, study under conditions where there's, there's, there's tremendous accommodation shortages, the lecture halls aren't big enough, and 45%, only 45% of black students were able to finish their degrees. Primarily that was happening because they were being financially excluded, not being able to meet the uh, fees that were being demanded from them. And this was a particular problem in the historically white universities whose fees were higher, it's considerably higher than the historically black universities, which are the vocational, more technically related universities. And we saw a, a movement that was bubbling around the alienation of these students in these historically white universities where black staff were a, a small minority, where the culture was very white, where the whiteness was dripping off the walls, very much like in this grand uh, auditorium we're sitting in. It's a, and it's that alienation that is driving uh, the politicization and the, the beginnings of a political program which begins with the fight to remove the statue of Rhodes outside of the university that sits at the center of the University of Cape Town. Um, and it's primarily a middle class, low, what we can term as lower middle class students in South Africa. The, the, the children of our civil servants whose parents can't afford to pay the fees because they don't, aren't, um, they don't qualify for financial aid, financial scholarships. And the, so, you, what, what we see is the, uh, the emergence or the, the merging of the political alienation um, around the, you know, the curriculum, the culture, the administration, the teaching staff, the, the infrastructural backlogs and so on, coming together with this situation of the, the commodification of the universities where fees are just rising year after year after year. 9% on average per annum in, in, the, in the film which we screened last night. Um, and, you know, while those students who are really struggling are, are probably in the minority, uh, they are propelling forward the, the political program uh, which is based around uh, a critique of, of, of the university as a uh, an unashamedly commodified, privatized space, a capitalist space, um, a neoliberal space, to demand you know, with that fight around fees to, to, to stop fees increasing, it quickly moves into a fight for free education against the user pay model, against the, the, the universal drive of, of capitalist countries around the world to make us pay for everything we consume, things that we considered and from our generation, and I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking for many people here, as public goods, we didn't have to pay to go to university. We didn't have to. Uh, we were paid to go to university. We received grants uh, of those of us whose parents were not rich. Now, it's these, it's the, the, the and, and we see the emergence of Afro-pessimism and all forms of, so, so the re-emergence of Pan-Africanism, the, uh, 
the, um, from where I stand, the very ambiguous notion of Afro-pessimism, but what did Afro-pessimism bring? It brought with it a flag that said, enough is enough. Um, we are not going to allow ourselves to be assimilated. This university is our university, and we will, we will build it in our own image. We will build it for our own needs. Um, and, uh, it, and, and this is the tremendous, and I'll finish here. This is a tremendously exciting thing about this movement. It, gen it, it generates a, a wider critique of society. It puts forward, as the tr trade unions of yesteryear, a, 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 what we describe as a militant abstentionist program, that this is not our economy. This, we are not uh, responsible. We will not make the sacrifices that this economy and this mode of production is demanding from us. It is stripping us of our dignity, and we need an alternative. And we have a new political vision that emerges, a very strong uh, critique of our current uh, status quo, um, a vision which has been missing from our body politic, a vision that is missing from the body politic around the world, Social democracy is increasingly a bankrupt ideology which is taking us on the road to nowhere. So I'll leave you with those thoughts. Thank you so much, Rahad, on that. Uh, so much for food for thought here. Now, you're talking about capitalism. It hasn't met the needs of the people. And I know that, Atieno, you've worked with structural transformation of African economies. How can we then build on from what we just heard to make sure that all that shrinkles to the greater good of the people? Thank you very much. I think that um, South Africa always gives us uh, examples that make you think and you know, from Desai's uh, presentation, I think if you think about the effects, or at least one of the most uh, talked about effects of capitalism is this idea of a concentration of wealth that manifests in very uh, deep inequalities and inequities. And obviously that creates its own dynamics uh, and struggles and contestations. Um, I had, um, and, and you know, in part, this will respond to the specific question you put to me, um, Vicky. I wanted to, you know, when I was asked to come and do this, I shared this with a couple of friends, and it was interesting the responses that I got back, because if you just give the question, you, I'm going to speak about whether the future of Africa is capitalist or not. And you know, I have WhatsApp messages that go like, of course it is, like, how dare you ask, why are you asking? So I think it's probably not to go into answering the questions. I think we all have, maybe even like it's why I ask, it's obvious. Um, but to kind of try and look at uh, what are the elements of um, capitalism, and then we can all make our own deductions. If you think about capital accumulation, if you think about the place of private property, if you think about the idea that markets are competitive and they work well, you have a price system, you have a wage labor system and all of that. But if you put all that aside, um, the reality obviously is something different. So capitalism promises a lot of things, but I think we all know that in reality, that's not quite the ideal type that you get. And that a lot depends on what interventions happen, and especially from the state, in terms of regulation, and whether that regulation is then for the public good or for private interests. Maybe that's where uh, the dynamic is interesting. So I think there's obviously a disconnect between the promise and what reality presents. Coming back to Africa, and if we're asking the question that this panel wants to answer is, What's the visioning process? What's the thinking process? Um, if you think about the structure of the economies. And if I'm to refer to one fundamental blueprint right now that's current, the Africa Agenda 2063, if you analyze it, in many ways, it is a document that suggests that, at least for the political elites in Africa and business elites, that that future is potentially capitalist. So if you unpack it, if you look at its promise, you think of the flagship projects, it advocates these big infrastructure type projects uh, for which 
finance, you know, will come from sources that include blend finance, and maybe you know this would be an area that you speak to. Uh, then you can see that perhaps uh, in many ways that visioning, at least from the elites, is one um, that's capitalistic in its orientation. Um, even in terms of think tanks, so if you think of the Economic Commission for Africa, which in many ways uh, are supposed to offer alternatives or at least uh, capture a different visioning, I think in many ways they are now increasingly aligning with places like the McKinsey Global Law Institute, uh, who really are ideologues for a neoliberal outlook uh, to economies. So if African societies and economies are capitalistic, what might that look like? What would that be? What form will that take? Uh, and I think to look at that question, one has to think in terms of the history. So how did Africa get to where it is today? And after five centuries or more of engaging with capitalist accumulation, so if you think from you know, extraction processes that uh, lost the continent to huge labor force in the transatlantic slave trade and beyond, uh, to colonial occupation and extractions, uh, the fact that you've aggressively had uh, neoliberalism being brought to the continent, Undoubtedly, uh, these have shaped uh, the structure of its economy, but more than that, uh, its culture, its values, and its aspirations. So therefore, we can also argue that African economies are at different stages of this transition into capitalism, and the experiments have been uh, very, very diverse. But in many ways, when you look at Africa and its specific countries, you feel like it's a place that's essentially uh, a retail economy where you're exchanging natural resources, a lot of wealth in minerals, agricultural commodities are not processed, uh, in return for you know, debt and aid finance, in return for consumer goods. And this is primarily because industrialization has really taken off. You know, except for places like South Africa to an extent, and maybe Mauritius, uh, the rest of the continent is still very dominated by production systems that are not yet um, capitalistic in that sense. The second and third industrial revolution have happened, um, and rather than uh, improve productivity, uh, that accumulation is still very limited. So in the short history that uh, African countries have independent, uh, so you've had experiments with state capitalism, where you have the state dominates uh, the ownership of enterprise. Uh, you've had economies toy with corporate capitalism, but perhaps the most um, dominant influence, and that's evident right now, is the neoliberal form of capitalism. And with that, uh, you see the effect of geopolitical dynamics. So you feel the effect of the post-World War II pact, uh, which shaped European societies, and that's spilling over into the creation of the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank and the IMF, and the aid system, which had a very big role to play in the policy environment in Africa in the 50s to the early 70s. After that, you think of the Cold War and the tensions that arose from that. And all these things had an effect on African economies. I'll just flag again, if you think about the visioning and the thinking processes, um, the 1981 World Bank uh, Burge report, which for many Africans, I think, you hardly can talk about African economies without thinking about structural adjustment programs. But what is interesting, I think, in my view, is that this, in many ways, was a response to the Lagos Plan of Action of um, 1980 which was trying to have African economies be inward looking and choose a different path. But so a year later, you then have the World Bank produce what became the blueprint for structural adjustment programs and whose legacy, I think many Africans um, and other people who study Africa and are interested, was a legacy of neoliberalism uh, and whose um, footprints are still all over the continent. I won't go into the details of what those are I know my time is limited, so I'll rush to the other part of this, which was to think about, so if that's the picture of what it is, now what might accelerate this um, neoliberal agenda? And I think that the knowledge uh, role is, is a very powerful one. Now, if you think about the ideological convergence that's happening between the national, regional policy, political and business elite in support of neoliberal capitalism, that's very, very powerful. And the fact that it is powerful and dominant means that the space for anything that's alternative is very difficult. So you may have pockets of alternatives being discussed within NGOs or within academia, but it holds very little sway on actually how policy is made or in terms of public opinion. More worryingly also as a driver is that when Pan-African or what are supposed to be Pan-African agendas are put out there, uh, again by the elite, 
So for instance, I mentioned Agenda 2063, but if you think also of the, like, the big infrastructure projects that come from uh, NEPAD, which is the New Partnership for Africa's Development, the sort of vision for you know, huge infrastructure projects, which in an ideal sense should be good things, but when you think about the modes of finance that are being proposed for how you get them to happen, then you're thinking of the role of um, you know, foreign investors in the privatization of public assets and the implications of those uh, on our economies. And more worryingly also is what it does to the distribution of income and the levels of inequalities um, that exist. So there is a worry around this aggressive penetration of global finance capital uh, on African markets. The final um, accelerator that I'll talk about is demographic shifts. So if you also think of how young the continent is, so on the one hand, people talk a lot about the opportunity for demographic dividend, but you know, for you to get the dividend, you'd have to make investments, and the window for doing that is probably not that long. Uh, but on the other hand, you also have a youthful population that's very, because of globalization, very linked uh, to the global economy. And so their desires for consuming things that are actually not produced on the continent uh, means that you probably import a lot more, you know, and things that you don't produce. And what does that do uh, for accumulation, but also for deepening inequalities? But I don't think it's all about, you know, it's all gloom and doom. I think there's um, always with capitalism, people talk about the potential to disrupt and maybe the contradictions that the system creates of opportunities um, to, to disrupt. So disruption might happen from extreme levels of wealth concentration. My own country, Kenya, is one where the levels of inequalities are so deep that ultimately when you look at it, you feel like ultimately something has to give. It's not sustainable. You cannot have the sort of disparities that you have and you know, forever and ever. So ultimately, I think, and this I think is true, even if you think about the United States of America right now, and some of the dynamics of the politics that's going on is that the levels of wealth concentration and inequalities itself will create a dynamic that might force, if not uh, an alternative form of capitalism, but uh, you know, if not an alternative per se, which I think has been elusive, but certainly an alternative form. So that contestation might create something different. The fourth industrial revolution with you know, new information technologies and all of that, and again, referring back to the youthful population and the ability to use these tools, might also mean that you have the power to organize and mobilize. And so it's possible to organize differently and create different uh, possibilities. Democracies and assault, I think, the world over. But that process itself of consolidating democracy or trying to uh, expand it also creates the possibilities for concessions. So I think that activism can push for alternative policy agendas, um, and elite politicians might make certain concessions. And then finally, in terms of the global stage where we see a retreat almost of multilateralism and you know, as nationalism rises and there's all this push towards the right, uh, it's also possible that that will create its own counterforce and balance and it may well be that we have a redefined uh, multilateral outlook. But what if the future for Africa wasn't capitalist? <laughs> and I think that um, you know, we can look to other people who've thought about this, you know, Samira Main comes to mind if you think about scholars who've dare to think about this, as to whether these options may be viable, you know, the ideas around how you boost uh, local production and think about, you know, making the sorts of investments that you need to make, again, the demography thing being one of Africa's biggest assets to try and uh, use that as a game changer. But I think that all these decisions are things that ultimately have to be uh, fought for and made possible in the political realm and arena and we know how many challenges are within that space. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Atiano, for those uh, uh, shared ideas. Now, the things you mentioned about the new technologies being a way to look at how Africa moves forward in the future where we are today and the days to come. I know that Sangu, you work as an entrepreneur, you've worked in startups, and there's this idea that how do we then get the youth, the over 70% of the population being under 30, to actually start? Where do we get that capital to get the ball rolling if, to move forward to making sure that we all get what we are doing, some, some parts of what we want to get to move from poverty. If you have any thoughts of how we can, can move forward. Sure. Um, 
I'll start first with a story, a quick story. You know, when I was about five years old, we lived, we moved to a new neighborhood in Accra called East Lagon. And at that time, it was all forest, and they were constructing a road. So my five-year-old self, I had an entrepreneurial idea. The construction workers, they did not have anywhere to buy water because there was nothing there. So they'd have to, they would have to walk miles and miles to go and get water. So in the morning before school, I would fill little plastic bags with water, put it in the fridge, and then when I'd get back, I'd set up my little table and I'd sell them water. My mother found some coins in my school shorts and said, where is this money from? And I proudly told her about my entrepreneurial idea and she was upset and shut down my business and told me that, you know, you, you can't do that. They're building the road, you should, you should give the water. I was very upset as a child. I thought this is my great idea to make big bucks, and she's shutting it down. Now, I'll come back to my mother and, and what that means for us as we think about it. What's our context? One of the big important things that I think is missing here is we mentioned the youth, but the job creation problem we have. We have 11 million young people that enter the labor force every year and they only meet three million jobs. In my country, Ghana, 250,000 people enter the job force, and there are only 5,000 jobs created in the formal economy. And, and this is with us at 1.1, 1.2 billion. We're forecasted to be 2.5 billion, one in four people globally. So it, it's, there's a, there are certain pragmatic realities here that we are confronted with. There's a time ticking bomb. How do we create jobs for this growing mass of unemployed young people? There's also the other context of technology and what technology is doing. You've had massive economic growth over the last century, but in the last 30 years, there's been a problem where a lot of the economic growth, which has mostly been driven by technology, leading to gains in productivity, you've not really seen the same sort of growth in real wages. And so you've seen that as opposed to the period before where there was some sharing in that growth, a lot of the benefits from the economic growth enabled by technology has accrued to the owners of capital. And this is what has in part led to this sort of rising inequality and the social problems that we're having. But it gets even more interesting. If you think that technology of the last 30 years has created this, Think of the technology of the next 30, artificial intelligence. What would artificial intelligence mean for us? You know, I went to the, I had this interesting debate I watched between uh, Demis Hassabis, the, the co-founder of DeepMind. DeepMind is one of the leaders in AI. In fact, DeepMind, they were so great that with zero dollars in revenues, Google bought them for half a billion dollars. And Kasuo Ishiguro, the winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. And Demis had this idea of we can get to this point where AI will replace all, you know, a lot of the work we'll do, and then, you know, we can really truly focus on what matters. And Kasuo Ishiguro had an interesting thought where he said, but is there dignity in work? Right? Is there something about work that creates inherent human dignity? So these are questions we're going to have to grapple with as we see the proliferation of AI technologies that's coming for us. It's already happening and it's going to continue to happen. The third thing that's important for the context is the role of government. A lot of times we, we tend to think of capitalism as this free market system somewhere there in the ether, but, but government plays a huge role in it. The policies in Tesla wouldn't be Tesla today if it wasn't for US government policies enabling tax credits for solar technology. Right? And, and I've seen, at least in the tech space, I've seen glimmers of hope and opportunity. And I'll point to some quick examples. Andela, which is a tech startup operating on the continent. It's in Kenya. It just opened a hub in Rwanda, started in Nigeria, in Uganda, and opened an office in Ghana. And Andela has this fantastic idea where it, they train software developers on the continent, and they get them to do global work. And so you're creating an ecosystem of tech developers that remain. So you're not contributing to brain drain. Um, they're able to earn you know, relatively high incomes 
and it contributes to the growth of a local tech ecosystem. Andela promises to create 100,000 developers. On GitHub, out of 3.9 million developers there, only about 5,000 come from the African continent. So the impact of that is going to be huge. M Pharma, another tech startup from Ghana that won the Skoll Award for the best social enterprise of the year. M Pharma has, has built a technology that allows it to reduce the price of drugs. Because the average drug across the continent, people pay about two to 300% more for drugs because of the fragmentation. But they've leveraged their technology to figure out a win-win-win for everybody. And they're now in about six or seven African countries. So you're seeing a lot of tremendous value being created by some of these tech businesses who are, you know, in the space of a few years. I mean, one of them is now worth close to a billion dollars in the space of just three years. So all of this, for me, all of this is less a question of is our future capitalist or not. It's almost like, you know, is religion good for Africa? We won't get into that. <laughs> right? But to me, it's about, and this kind of goes back to my mother's question, what, what are the boundaries and what are the values that should govern our economic system? What matters? Was my mother right to tell me I shouldn't go on with my great business that I thought at the time of selling water to the construction workers? Right, what about in, in these neighborhoods, you know, the little kids who put out the little lemonade stands? Right? Why is that right and why is there a problem with mine? Um, how do we think about the dignity of work? And importantly, we shouldn't think about it as an abstract because we play a role. We are the enablers of the system. One of uh, my favorite artists is Jay-Z. And Jay-Z had this line that he said, truthfully, I want to rhyme like common sense. I did five million, I haven't been rhyming like common since. And, and, and then he later says, you know, um, I want to rhyme, I want to rap intricate, but intricate to get you wood critics. And so it's because if he raps about deep, amazing things, no one wants to buy his music. But when he raps about money cash holes, he sells five million records. And so what role do we play as a consumer? How do we vote with our wallet, right? Are we prepared? There's a cost to creating that shared economic prosperity. There's a cost to it. There was a study done in Ghana that if we implemented emission standards, the average price of a car would go up by $2,000. So when they first say emission standards, everyone is like, yes, yes, the environment. When they says, are you prepared to pay an extra $2,000? People are like, hey, let's, let's, let's slow down, right? So to what degree are we individually as consumers and enablers of this system, prepare to pay the price. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Sangu. I'm sure your mother is very proud of you right now, despite uh, trying to throw to your entrepreneurship. Um, Dr. Hazel Gray, you've worked with some African governments uh, in terms of finance and looking at how they can govern and help grow their economies and such. And there's, um, there's a question that uh, Sangu just asked, you know, how, what value should, should our governments be putting on the economic systems that we have in place? And will that help move the economy of the continent and its people? Um, I'll come back to that uh, towards the end. I mean, I had prepared three points, but I do speak to those things. And as a lecturer, obviously, I've got a three-part answer to, to the question, hopefully in five minutes. Um, and I wanted to um, go back to a tweet that came out um, earlier on in the week when there were some adverts for this session. Um, I'm afraid I don't have the person's name, but they, they tweeted, and why um, should we uh, think about the future when we have so much to deal with in the present? And... Um, I mean, I think that's a, an important prompt for this panel, but um, claims on um, and descriptions of uh, Africa's future have played um, a, a very powerful role over time, a uh, political role in relation to uh, capitalism as a form of resistance and a way of challenging uh, racialized capitalism because it's based on the idea that the future is different and it creates a space for 
political projects of resistance and alternatives. So you know, the anti-colonial struggles were based on uh, uh, thinking about futures and articulating those futures and the Afrofuturism and insurgent uh, futurisms um, play uh, a very important role in the present today because they provide these spaces and they provide a way of thinking through um, policies or approaches or political agendas. Um, uh, and, I mean, if you think about uh, the way that Africa's future has been conceived, it really has gone through very distinct shifts. So we've moved from Afro-pessimism, which has already been mentioned, that, you know, the idea that there is no future, there's no escape from the structural imperatives of global capitalism. And on the right, that was... Um, a portrayed as being something inherently dysfunctional about the African state that was leading to uh, a, a lack of transformation. And on the left, obviously, that was a focus on how global capitalism operated to foreclose uh, alternative uh, futures. Um, so thinking about Africa's future in relation to capitalism, I think it also speaks to the challenge that uh, Mamadou Diouf said yesterday about reinventing uh, universalisms. Um, of course, um, Thinking about the future isn't inherently progressive, um, and I think that's particularly important to keep in mind at the moment. Um, you know, when you have a consolidation of power behind fascist tendencies which exist in our societies. Um, so, you know, thinking about what um, the idea of Africa's future does to um, uh, new forms and, and uh, new forms of racialized capitalism. Uh, that are emerging and, and have forces behind them as well as oppositions. Um, and the rethinking about Africa's future is also obviously linked to a lacuna in the West about thinking of the future, um, which comes from a kind of late capitalist malaise about um, lack of uh, productivity growth, lack of uh, very low growth rates, uh, climate change, etc. the idea that there is no way of thinking beyond uh, capitalism. Um, in the face of uh, 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 long-term uh, decline and um, austerity and, and climate breakdown. And obviously the necessity of rethinking the future then, I think a lot of this can draw on thinking about Africa's futures from uh, African thinkers, artists, uh, writers, um, uh, and, and the histories of, of the idea of Africa's future, um, which prevented, you know, we're, we're always at some form of, of, of vanguard in terms of uh, presenting new world orders. So it's interesting in a way that in the kind of revival moment about Africa's futures and a new idea of what Africa's future could be, that it draws very little on these older debates about a radical alternative uh, uh, image and, and so at the moment the shift from afro pessimist futures to uh, afro optimist futures are based on an idea of um, a peaceful and a commercial uh, imagination of capitalism uh, which will involve inclusion and integration and a smooth path of uh, building productive capacities and uh, 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 an integration uh, that will lead to um, a win-win situation that will tap into new technologies, uh, new business models, allow business and society to, uh, to benefit and to deliver social goods in a way that is envisaged to also overcome uh, climate uh, change challenges. Um, uh, and I think that you know, there's a lot that must be questioned about that. Obviously, these are um, diverse processes, and um, but they always cause both winners and losers. And I think there's been a lot of discussion which challenges the uh, inclusion narrative because people have posed the question: inclusion into what? On whose terms? Um, and so I think that you know, there's been a there's been an attention to the discursive practices or the discursive. Um, formulation of the future. But my second point is that um, because of the power of this idea of Africa's future, with, you know, the, the idea that integration in of, it, of itself is an easy and simple path to uh, a better world, I mean, we think, uh, my second point is that we really need to rematerialize this debate. So the, the critique that comes from a discursive perspective um, has done a lot of good work in this. But let's also then go back to what are the actual uh, capitalist forms that we see on the continent in their diversity. 
uh, and in the contestations that exist, uh, they're not taking it as a given in any context on any scale that capitalism operates, but let's explain, explore and describe what's actually going on in everyday uh, life. Um, and I mean, the odd thing about the visions of uh, uh, the, the, the simplistic visions of inclusion are that the economy itself is, is very much missing from uh, these debates. Um, and simple, um, you know, it's very much based on an idea of uh, uh, drawing on economic theory of Say's law, for example, because you have a lot of young people, because you have a growing uh, youth that needs employment, that somehow that will create jobs in and of itself. And this is the core of uh, mainstream economic Say's law, that if you have uh, supply, it will create its own demand. Um, but, you know, the other uh, features that we see of a kind of uh, post-work future where there's simply not enough jobs that, you know, productive activities uh, that lead to quality jobs, not just a, a, a wage, but also something that gives dignity, maybe our, the economic system that we have simply can't uh, produce those. Um, so, I mean, if you look at the actual processes of capitalist change and transformation that are going on, what you see is also these global tendencies playing out, you know, the consolidation, the rise of large firms in value chains, um, the fact that there are very few middle-sized firms, you have uh, in food systems, you have the emergence of uh, multinationals, regional multinationals that are dominating uh, sis uh, systems of provisioning, shaping changing consumption patterns. Um, you have um, very low wage rates, so as a continent, uh, Africa has the lowest uh, wage growth in the world, and we've already discussed the issues of um, inequality and um, changes in the functional distribution of income so that you have you know, uh, less and less going to in wages of the overall surplus, more and more into uh, interests and profit. And that has implications for people's everyday consumption, how much do people actually get the benefit of the processes of growth. So here's the thing that I want to end on. I mean, in all of this, I think we need to um, draw on so much of the economic thinking around the future that is so fertile from Africa, and I particularly point here to actually Nyerere's writing on basic needs, and recentering actually with um, processes of consumption themselves. I mean, a lot of the debate about Africa's future and integration has um, been based on um, looking at the uh, socioeconomic through the lens of production, but we need to recenter on, uh, on, on what we consume and why and who uh, and who makes decisions about processes of consumption, because that also allows us to think about uh, basic needs and drawing on the work of also another Tanzanian, Justinian Riemamu, who emphasized the role of um, the home market and the domestic market. And these are actually where the major processes of socioeconomic transformation are going on. You know, it's about forms of mundane, uh, everyday production that um, are the major component of consumption and the ways that people live their lives are much more important and, and impactful than the uh, small um, percentage of the economy that's tied into export markets or where they are tied into export markets on very um, disadvantageous uh, terms. So I think that you know, refocusing on consumption also allows us to, to, to draw on a wonderful tradition of um, economic thought from uh, within the continent. Um, Re Mamu uh, Nyereri, also Tandika Mkandawire's uh, work on rethinking the social in regards to the economic. Um, and if that can be brought into these reimaginings of the future or the imaginings of the future, I think that you know, answering the question of uh, uh, placing uh, Africa in the center of thinking about a new economic order really uh, could come to fruition. And because I think it would be good to try and answer this question, I would like to say that in the near future, yes, clearly Africa's future is capitalist. And it's so important to recognize that because you have to start from the recognition of the enormous strength uh, of the capitalist system itself, the way that the surplus is used to re, uh, uh, reinforce its institutions over time. And if you start off from that perspective, it allows you to then be more um, uh, 
uh, active and, and think about and work towards uh, alternatives in the long run. And in terms of the further future, I don't think we can know because the future itself is not just an intensification of the present. It is something very, very different from what we have today. So we shouldn't add to the foreclosure of the future by saying we know what's going to happen. Actually, this will be an African future in, in the way that people have said, a, a continent that is taking up a much larger share um, of the world with so much to offer in terms of its contribution to thinking about um, our common futures. Uh, thank you, Hazel. I know we are, I'm very conscious of the time and I would like to hear some thoughts as I'm sure the rest of the panel would if you have any questions. But I just want to throw something out there for maybe you guys to answer, maybe somebody else who might have an answer to my question is, we are talking about reimagining the future for Africa, uh, where we are headed and all this, but can Africa actually be able to develop, reimagine its own economic system where we go from, we don't think of mixed economies or capitalism or socialism. Is that a possibility that we can also try to envisage happening for the continent? So we can now open for the floor um, and please keep it short so that these guys have time to answer you uh, in full. Anyone have questions? While we're waiting for that, I have a comment there. Is, this is where I think there's a huge role for um, the arts and the creative side, right? Where um, if you look at a lot of innovation and technology has lagged what you first saw. So you have these science fiction writers who would talk about all these things and then later you see it happen, right? Where they, they play that role of creating that imagination. And I think that's, there's a huge, like when I watched Black Panther, Right. Wakanda was fascinating for me in its imagination. Um, and I think similarly, our, our, our artists, our writers, our creatives, our um, science fiction writers, there's a role for them to also play in, in kind of imagining what that future can look like. Thank you. I think we've got a question over there in the back. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you so much for the panel, first of all. Um, I was just thinking um, around the question of if there is if the future of Africa will be capitalist. Um, and when I think of capitalism, I think of colonial violence, I think of uh, the violence of statecraft, the high mortality rates for working classes and people at the margins. Um, and, you know, so I guess, I guess my conclusion, uh, concluding question would be, um, is there a future in capitalism? Um, can we imagine a future in capitalism um, bef before, you know, climate breakdown and uh, the breakdown of, uh, you know, just, you know, violence and, and trauma and all of that. So. Who wants to go first among you? Should we take a few questions? Let's take a few. Rahad, would like a few more? It's the same question. Jidek said a few years ago, it's easier on the climate crisis to imagine the end of the world than imagining the end of capitalism. I think the paucity of this discussion has reflected this. I think we are, we, we are not allowed to imagine an alternative anymore because we had 40 years of neoliberalist imagination being imposed over the self. And I think this is a problem because Africa is integrated in the capitalist world system through an even combined development uh, in, a, in a perverse way that gives us Marikana. Marikana is an example of what capitalism can do for you and for us. So do we have a problem of imagination because we have been uh, for 40 years in the situation we have been into? And this is not an African problem. It's a much wider problem. There's another question in the back. Is it on? Where? Yeah, hi, Lindsay Whitfield, Roskilde University. I would just like to say, could you comment on the diversity in the future of capitalism in the sub-Saharan African continent? Because we've been talking about Africa, but Africa is not a place. And I'm a, an economist, and there's an increasing diversity in the economic trajectories across sub-Saharan Africa from Ghana, um, to Tanzania, to Ethiopia, to Sub-Saharan, to South Africa, to Madagascar, and we've been talking about it as if it's one place and it has this 
common future trajectory, where actually I would say we're going to see increasingly diverse trajectories with some countries becoming more capitalist, some not, some being more based on extractives, some more agrarian, some more manufacturing, and we're going to see actually increasingly diversity in economies. Thank you for that. Any more questions? We've got a gentleman here in the front. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, we're, t we're thinking of uh, capitalism in the West, but I was wondering if you can project towards what's going on in China. China is becoming extremely important in African scene, and it may change the relationship of Africa in relation to China might be the center of the future, and how are Africans dealing with the presence of China as a major economic force? in the global sphere, and it is going to be the most important economy in the future. I have no doubt in my mind. So can we project for the future how China is going to influence Africa? Thank you for the question. So, um, Atiana, would you like to begin? They're not necessarily answers. I mean, I think most of this is kind of broad reflections. The one that has struck me is the one about uh, need for nuance, that you know, Africa is many countries, and the realities are probably very varied. But are they, I think that if you unpack uh, whether it's Ethiopia and Rwanda being seen as developmental states, but underlying this seeming more progressive. So I think it's really like a continuum of capitalism. It's different forms of the same thing. I don't think that anybody has dared uh, in recent history to be doing something fundamentally different. So I think the outcomes probably vary because of the specific context, but the underlying system is one and the same. So if you think about the role of finance and increasing financialization of these economies. I think even whether it's Ethiopia, Ghana, Rwanda, or it's Kenya, I think the similarities are more striking in my view than the differences. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the question of that Africa is so perversely integrated into the capitalist system, I mean, I couldn't agree more because I think the fact of globalization itself is a representation of this dominance. Uh, and Therefore, imagining an alternative is something that I think the rest of the world who wants something different has been grappling with and hasn't succeeded. In my notes, I had said something about, but is it possible to imagine a different form? Because I think what we've succeeded in having are uh, alternate forms, uh, but not an alternative per se. And even in moments where everybody in the world has thought you have an opportunity uh, capitalism has probably thrown a lot of contradictions and you think that there's a dynamic that could create something alternative, it doesn't quite happen. So if you think about post-2008, the financial crisis, which is maybe in recent history where that contradiction peaked, you have Occupy movements and you know there's like a, a whole momentum building, but then it disperses somehow. Um, and if you look across the world right now, there are enough contradictions to make you think that, but isn't this the moment for an alternative? But somehow everybody falls short of talking about an alternative. Even if you think of the politics in the US right now, everybody gets excited about Bernie Sanders, but he wouldn't go as far as saying that there is an alternative. So radical things become things like saying healthcare is universal, or that you know there shouldn't be so many poor people, but nobody dares go beyond. So I think that's a, a more universal problem of how do you craft an alternative and can you craft an alternative in the present world? Rahad, any answers? <clears throat> yeah. Um, I th are these sort of concluding comments? They can, they can be included, yes. No, concluding. Are we, are we going... You're answering the few questions that... And yeah. then we're going back? Briefly. Okay, all right. So yeah, China. Oh. China is a powerhouse which is ravaging the continent in, in no, uh, you know, the power of state capitalism in, in, in China, the way they're doing the deals. Uh, really, the Chinese and the willingness of the China Development Bank to op do deals in an open and corrupt manner has just brought down Jacob Zuma. I mean, we, um, we bought uh, 55 billion rands worth of locomotives. Um, and instead of those going to Germany, Japan, and a different consortium, and some of them, you know, some of that assembly taking place in South Africa, it all went to China. 
it all went to China because China was willing to pay the 20% fixer fee to the Guptas, the emigre brothers who have been lining the pockets of uh, Jacob Zuma's son. So it is as corrupt and as bankrupt as uh, the Western capitalism. Let's have no illusions about China and its need uh, to grow, its, its need to spend its, uh, it, the money it's generating around the world and, and to reinvest that. And it does that without any respect or reference to human rights, to local industrialization, to the development of local labor and so on. So on China, uh, yeah, it's capitalism. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the situation, isn't it? And, uh, you know, you can hear from my accent that I, I grew up in this place. Um, one, th I've been back in South Africa for, for 30 years, but the, the one thing that makes me proud uh, about this country is it's declared, it declared it the uh, climate emergency. We are in a climate crisis mode. We are in environmental collapse. We have just seen the biggest catastrophe in the global south, the first city in the world to be consumed by climate, by this climate, this climate crisis. But Baira in Mozambique, 3.5 million people affected. And what is the response of the bastion of international capitalism, World Bank? Well, we'll, we'll give you a loan to help you, uh, you know, rehabilitate your country alone at huge rates and so on. So I think their capitalism has failed miserably and it is no longer an historically progressive force in any shape or form. It is destroying the future of our children and our grandchildren. We now know that one million species uh, will face extinction in, in, in the near future. We now know that possibly as early as 2030 will we be seeing a series of cataclysmic events around the world and while buildings and infrastructure will be severely affected in the global north, uh, in the global south, Hundreds of millions of people's lives will be ruined. Uh, we know uh, the continent, because of its huge land mass and around the equator, that two, three hundred million people now will no longer be able to live in the Sahara region, the equatorial region. It will simply be too hot to live there any longer. So we have to find an alternative. There's no ifs and buts. We are forced to find an alternative. And the alternative, the role of ideas is critically important. The generation of ideas are critically important. The role of the university, therefore, becomes critically important. And we need to move away from this conventional notion of academia and the conclusive stuff and move towards the, the more substantive arguments, uh, you know, as a substantive approach rather than demanding hard, conclusive uh, ends to, to evidence and so on. We've, we've got to be a much more value-driven, and that's where the importance of, of storytelling is, because we know that the, now from the life sciences that the same place in the brain which uh, uh, deals with values also deals with emotions. And we've got to have a good story to tell because story is emotionally and value driven. Um, we've got to stop coming to our story at the end of our papers and put our point of view at the beginning of the papers. We've got to make our work as academics much more accessible than what it is because we are in urgent need of new innovative and, dare say, revolutionary ideas in order to stop the extinction, the, the sixth extinction, which the, uh, the Extinction Rebellion guys are now talking about. Thank you so much, Rehat.
Um, Hazel, do you have some uh, quick answers to the questions? Um, I don't think there's ever been a lack of imagination. Um, it's more been a problem of the exhaustion of political organization in the face of um, uh, the shadow of a massive defeat. So I think that the ideas are there, and we have so many ideas that we can draw on that aren't necessarily new but have never come to uh, full fruition. And so I think you know the artists, the authors have always done a good job about presenting us with alternative futures, but just to mobilize and to bring those to fruition is enormously challenging when everyone is just exhausted from the day to day. Um, and uh, I mean, uh, everything that you've said about China, I would concur with, but I think that there is also another dynamic with the interaction of um, China and many countries in Africa in the sense that there's, you know, the, the personal level, the, the extent of exchange, which leads to a different paths of circulation and idea transformation and um, examples in my own research on industrialization, I see that there's a lot of um, kind of informal technology transfers that aren't about large firms, but are about people learning how to make new forms of shampoo from their neighbors, from, from Chinese neighbors, for example, which are also transformatory, um, but not about large scale capital. Um, and then Lindsay's comment, your comment on um, diversity. Yes, certainly, there. You know, this is what capitalism is. It causes specialization. Um, you know, they, and not just at the national level, but within countries, this increasing um, uh, specialization, niche, niche production. Um, uh, yeah. So I mean, I, I, I agree with you about that. I don't. I don't feel very um, optimistic about that as being a path to something better, but I think your point is absolutely well taken. Thank you, Hazel. Um, I'm going to quickly throw to Sangu for the answers to the questions before each one of them gets a minute to round up. Um, and I've got a surprise for you, a surprise announcement, so if you wet up, it will be good. So on, on the first question, look, I hear you on the you know, colonial violence and all of that, but my slight pushback there is the same thing when it comes to when people talk about democracy or they talk about Christianity. I, it, it, there's a sense in which I think it's falsely portrayed as this West thing, as if there were no... I mean, if you look at the earliest origins of Christianity, Africans were involved in it. There were certain forms of democracy in our indigenous social political institutions. And it's not as if there was no forms of capitalism among Africans before Europeans came. I mean, I was five years old and I had this idea. No white guy came and put the idea in my mind. And if you go to our pre-colonial history, we've had long histories of um, Africans engaging with capitalism. So I think we need to challenge that, right? And if we're confronting it, let's confront it on our own terms. And if there are problems with capitalism, it's problems that, yes, there's the global issues, but there's also things we contribute to it. So let's, let's, that, that, that's one point I want to make. Um, the second is on, on this integration thing. Yes, it's, I completely agree. But to me, that's also where uh, there's a role for our governments to play. There's a role for the African Union to play, right? This is where things like, this is where Pan-Africanism to me offers real opportunity. Because as a combined entity, we're at $4 trillion in spending power, 1.2 billion people, and we can negotiate with leverage. Right? No one is going to come and, and uh, power has never been given freely. Right? No one is going to come and, and, and say, here you go. But I think by us you know, taking a Pan-African approach, um, we're more likely to actually be able to, to, to contest for that power and negotiate on terms that work for us. And the same with China. China has their own interests. And they are pursuing that interest. And I'm not going to be angry at China for pursuing its interest. What's our interest as Africans? Where is our culpability in that? In our negotiations with China, why is it that China always gets the good end of the deal? Right? And so I think there's a sense also in which we, we also need to make sure that in all the deals, whether it's China or it's Japan or it's Europe or whoever it is, we need to make sure that that African interest is, is, is being guarded. Um, and um, on, on the climate crisis, there's, 
it's a big and a very real issue, and one that if you go to a lot of communities, fishing communities, and other communities, so on and so forth, they bear the brunt of it. But there's also a sense that the West has polluted its way to 60,000 per dollar GDP per capita, and is now like, whoa, 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 guys, we need to slow down, right? And, and it doesn't work, right? We can't talk about climate change without talking about global redistributive justice. Because we're not going to also just sit in poverty, right, and say, there's a cost. Sustainable economic, there's a reason why capitalism doesn't just jump for climate change, because it's more expensive. So someone has to bear the cost. Who is going to bear that cost? So if we're going to have an effective conversation about climate change, let's also have a real conversation about global redistributive justice and who is going to bear the cost for the very needed changes that need to, to, to happen. And finally, um, on imagination, I'm so happy you brought that up because it's true. I mean, our artists, I was in Zimbabwe and I went to this uh, art gallery and it was amazing. The artists were kind of expressing their frustrations, not just with what's going on locally, but a lot of the art expressed their frustrations with the global systems. And so if you just pay attention to the art in music, immortal technique for the last decade has been rapping about the ills of the global capitalist system. So I think that there's a lot of that in art, but it's, it's just a sense of how do we take those ideas. Maybe we should probably, next time, we should invite some artists to these academic gatherings, play some music and, 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 and have some, some exposure to that and see how we can filter that into policy and filter that into action. Thank you, Sangu. So we are, we've come to the end of our, our chat. So briefly, each one of you, if you can just give us thoughts to take home and think about as we, as we head into the future. Hazel. I think maybe the conclusion drawing from your last comment is we need to listen to the artists a bit more. <laughs> Rahad, you are an artist. I am. And uh, I think we need a slogan and we need to daub it over this, beautifully, this beautiful hall that's just cost £40 million pounds to renovate. All power to the imagination. That go back to the old 1968 student revolution uh, slogan. And I think in terms of the imagination, some of that is in our deep past. I sat in, uh, next to Sagu at breakfast this morning and he had a t-shirt on. And the t-shirt read, the future is female and African. Matriarchy, uh, you know, in line with the keynotes, the opening thing, we've really, I think, is an inclusive, was an inclusive society, hunter-gatherer hunter societies. It was an egalitarian society. It, was, it wasn't the war-torn, bar, bar, barbaric society that Harari from Homo sapiens will tell us it was. And uh, I think we've got a lot to learn from that if we are going to be, become guardians once again of our planet, and that, that is critical. And to stop the dehumanizing tyranny of the marketplace, and the way it strips us of our dignity, to stop the massive land grabs that are going on in Africa so people, uh, you know, in the richer countries can safeguard their food supplies uh, going into the future. And finally, we are in crisis mode at a m number of levels, and this is forcing generalizations. The big problem and the big fear is much of that generalization is happening and moving to the right. There are the odd moments, and my Finnish comrades over there told me great you know, news from Finland in terms of the local elections. The, the, Den, the Danes were telling me, yeah, we beat the right back because the right wing are complete climate denialists and, and people aren't stupid. They know this climate is changing. And, and a couple of other places, but the general shift in some of the, in, in the, the big centers of the world, which have tremendous influence over our lives, whether it's India, whether it's America, whether it's Russia, whether it's China, 
and uh, the bastion, the so-called bastion of democracy, a Europe, it's shifting very dangerously to the right. And each and every one of you in this room has a job and a role to play in, the, in stopping that. Thank you. Thank you, Rahad. I think I've already told Sangu that I want that T-shirt. And I, if the future is African and female, uh, it's on to you, Atieno. You are the future. Um, just uh, to emphasize a point that I may have alluded to in my initial comments, I think that the form that capitalism is taking in Africa now, and for me, the worrying part is this aspect of financialization. It may be that we're not seeing it for what it really is, is that you're talking of a scenario where it's not about production. You know, in the past you knew, you know, maybe a company, a multinational will come and set up and produce something and sell. Now it's more like a few wealthy guys who have money and can leverage capital. And because you're dealing with governments that have very little alternative sources of finance, so you start from a scenario of debt, um, you have these demands that you need to service, and so your options for where you find money are very limited. And so if you end up going to, you know, corporate uh, for financing, what is the accountability mechanism there? I mean, you remember the Jubilee Debt Relief Campaign, and when you're dealing with the British Woods institutions, the World Bank and the IMF, that was bad, but at least then you had a mechanism because, you know, this ultimately were responsible to their own home countries and you could organize. But what is happening now is you may not even be able to trace the sources of this wealth and who these people are, but the kinds of deals that our governments are striking, and I'll come to the issue of our leaders and how they have the potential to mortgage our own not even for us, it's the future and the lack of caring where they can easily just mortgage away their countries without a care is the most scary part. Um, so you have deals that are, for instance, mortgaging national assets, things that you could never get back. And this is the sort of thing that's happening from country to country. Um, so for me, that's, uh, that's quite worrying and it's a question and, and we're ending with a hopeful note where we're saying there's a lot of creativity with the arts and expression and all of that. But there's such a disconnect between you know, the, the arena where the action happens, which is the leadership sphere, and the sorts of people who become leaders in Africa who take policy decisions that are far-reaching, uh, beyond their own lives, and, you know, the arena where you're thinking alternatives or you're having alternative values. So there's quite a disconnect there. So you can have all this wonderful expression in the arts and all of that, but it's not in the mainstream. It's outside of, it's in spite of. I think people are trying to somehow survive and express. But that same generation, this hopeful, youthful population that sometimes is expressive in the arts, is also the one that, so I put on or conscious. I mean, consciousness doesn't just happen. Consciousness is a result of investments you have to make in the education system. What are we being taught? Are we learning history? Is it the right history? And in many ways, you know, one worries when you look at our schooling system and things that we're being taught, whether that will equip them to be conscious enough to see this form that is coming now that is so complex. Uh, so whether we are able to even identify it, analyze it, and therefore organize around it uh, is a different question. Um, where activism and organizing is now changing as it would, you know, people are quite happy to just have a tweet, and once you've tweeted, you feel that you've done your bit uh, in activism. And so there's something missing there, you know, a generation that's very, things are very instant, uh, and you know, you feel good once you've done your little thing and you move on, but the challenges seem so uh, daunting. Uh, I'll end on that not very hopeful note, hopefully it's a point for, for, for reflection. Thank you. Thank you, Atieno. Sangu, you get the last word before I get the last word, and uh, let's hear your thoughts. Um, the future is female and African. Yay. Um, one of the things I loved about Black Panther was that the creator of the technology was Shuri, Shale's sister. Um, two things I, I, I want to leave everyone with. The first, I think, is on going back to a point I made earlier about our individual role in, in enabling the system and in creating the system. Um, and so the, there's the structural things we can talk about, but there's also the, you know, our personal and our collective accountability. And, and that's something that I hope everyone leaves thinking about the role you play as a consumer and as a participant in the system and what you can do individually and what we can do collectively to make a difference. Um, the second is on as we think about ideas, there's sometimes I would go back and read 
Nkrumah or Nyerere and, and, and some of, you know, and, and I feel almost ashamed about the, I just think of them in that era, the men and women of our liberation and the ideas they had and the different futures they imagined. Um, and it, it almost seems that outside the artist, we're, 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 almost, we're, we're almost comfortable with the incremental progress, right? I mean, in Kuma at that time, to be like one Africa, our own African socialism, whatever it is, and I mean, just those ideas, I think, um, is sorely lacking from our political leaders. And so um, we, need, we need new ideas for, for what can create a different future where my dream is that my grandchild will sit on my lap and I'll say, and will look at me and say, Grandpa, you mean Africa used to be blank poor? whatever it is you say, and I'll be like, yes, can you believe it? And my God, what a future. Wakanda forever. <laughs> Thank you. Before I even thank our panel, I would like to thank you guys for sitting in, for listening in, for contributing and asking the questions. Uh, it's, been, it's been a blast, it's gone quickly. So my thanks to Dr. Hazel Gray, Raha Desai, Atieno Ndomo and Sangudele for, for taking your time, for being here, for sharing your thoughts. And I did promise you uh, something, an announcement, and uh, I'm sure, I hope you will enjoy it. So we've held you, we've held your time. Uh, so there will be some refreshments as a kind thank you note for, for sitting and really having to deal with us all this afternoon. It's right outside, so there will be coffee, there will be tea and some water. Does that um, include South African wine? <laughs> did you bring some? Um, so yeah, so it's here, we're going to have coffee and tea uh, just downstairs. Uh, there is some sp uh, space is limited, but there will be some other spaces around. So once again, thank you so very much. Applause on to you.